As I step away from the hum of centrifuges and soft murmurs of the genetics lab, I look down at my checklist once more. DNA samples from the early 1900s are on today's agenda. They are stored deep within the lab's archive, a place rarely ventured into by most of my colleagues. There's a feeling of stepping back in time that accompanies the visit to the archive, a feeling that I find both eerie and thrilling. I work for something called the Longevity Project. It's an ambitious endeavor, aiming to break through the limitations of human biology to extend our lifespan. We work to unlock scientific immortality is the simple way of describing what we do. Glancing up at the large clock on the lab's wall, I make a mental note to not lose track of time once I'm down there. It's easy to do. My curiosity can be a double-edged sword. But today, I must stay focused. I approach my workstation, covered with half-filled petri dishes and meticulously labeled test tubes. I quickly log my progress with the current samples in the system. Once I'm done, I save the report, lock my computer, and push my chair back. Standing up, I stretch a bit, rolling my shoulders to alleviate the stiffness that comes from hours hunched over a microscope. With a final look at my tidy workstation, I grab my lab coat off the back of my chair and slip it on. I check my pockets, ensuring I have my keys, pen, notebook, and a small flashlight. Stepping out of my corner of the lab, I give a small wave to Lana, my colleague working on the gene sequencing for the project. She flashes me a quick smile before turning back to her work, the soft glow from the genetic analyzer casting an ethereal light on her focused face. A few more strides and I'm at the door leading to the lab's archive. I pull out my key, insert it into the lock, and turn. The lock disengages with a soft click. As I step into the archives, a gust of cold, stale air greets me, carrying the faint, musty smell of aging paper and dried ink. The room is large, dimly lit by sparse, flickering fluorescent lights hanging from a high ceiling, casting an eerie glow over the rows of dusty shelves. On one wall, a towering cabinet houses rows of neatly arranged glass slides, housing countless DNA samples preserved under layers of dust. Alongside, rows of vials in a long-forgotten cryo-storage unit glisten under the dim light. In a corner, a bulky, rusted microscope, possibly one of the first to be used in genetic research. As I work through the shelves, my eyes catch the glint of glass, half buried beneath a mound of yellowed paperwork. Intrigued, I reach for the frame and lift it, revealing a dust-covered picture. Blowing gently, the dust scatters, unveiling an image that sends a jolt of shock through me. There, captured in the grainy monochrome of an old photograph, is a man whose features strike a chord of unnerving familiarity. I nearly drop the frame in shock. The man bears an uncanny resemblance to my boss, Dr. Vander, but the neatly penned caption beneath the image reads, Professor Friedrich, 1880. The rational part of my brain rejects the idea immediately. No, it simply can't be. I feel a prickle of goosebumps creep up my spine as I study the photograph more closely. Those same piercing eyes, filled with an intelligent spark. Those sharp, angular features that give him an air of intellectual authority. Even with the same distinguished hair, the silver strands mirror Dr. Vander's. A soft chuckle slips out of me, a small relief in the heavy silence of the archive room. I shake my head, dismissing the thought that had briefly invaded my mind. It's unbelievable. Of course, the man in the photograph couldn't possibly be Dr. Vander. But the resemblance is striking. Undeniably so. On a whim, I pull out my phone and snap a quick photo of the photograph. I imagine showing it to Vander later, sharing a laugh over his historical twin. With a final look at Professor Friedrich's stern face, I replace the frame back into its dusty nest and return to the task at hand. I spend another hour or so sifting through the archives before I finally uncover the samples I came for. As I'm about to leave, I take one last look at Professor Friedrich's photo. I still can't shake the unsettling likeness. My footsteps echo off the high-ceilinged space as I tread toward Dr. Vander's office. 
The door stands ajar, revealing him sitting behind his desk, engrossed in a maze of paperwork that spreads out around him. As I pass by the office, he looks up, his piercing blue eyes catching mine. A warm, charismatic smile curls on his lips. Alex, he calls out, his voice imbued with a pleasant quality that has always put me at ease. I pause in my stride, turning to face him. Dr. Vander, I respond, lifting the small case of archived DNA samples in my hand. Found what I was looking for. His eyes light up, a genuine spark of interest flickering in them. That's great. He nods, leaning back into his chair. A soft sigh escapes him, one of relief perhaps. He looks at me for a moment longer, a hint of curiosity in his gaze, before turning his attention back to his work. But as he does, a thought nudges at me. Dr. Vander, I call out, halting him in his action. The words catch in my throat as I pull out my phone. I found something in the archive. It's, well, it's a little odd. Curiosity peeks in his eyes as I open the photograph of Professor Friedrich. I hand him my phone. He holds my phone, his gaze firmly locked onto the image. His reaction comes in the form of a deep, hearty chuckle that reverberates in the otherwise quiet lab. Well, isn't that something? He muses, a hint of amusement in his voice as he hands my phone back. I must have a long-lost twin roaming somewhere in the records of history. Relieved by his light-hearted response, I join him in his laughter. The tension that had lingered at the back of my mind starts to dissipate, replaced by the comforting thought that it was nothing more than a striking resemblance. The following days blend into each other, a mix of routine lab work and my growing obsession with the archives. I find myself sneaking off to the archives more often. I tell myself it's just curiosity, a mere fascination with the uncanny resemblance of Dr. Vander and the man from the 1880s. But deep down, I know it's more than that. There's a sense of foreboding that I can't shake off, a strange fear that creeps into the shadows of my mind. One afternoon while in the archives, a pile of disordered files in an obscure corner catches my eye. Kneeling down, I start reorganizing them. As I shift a heavy binder, a hollow echo reverberates through the room. Puzzled, I tap my knuckles against the wall, only to be met with the same soft echo. My heartbeat quickens as realization dawns on me. I start searching the wall, running my fingers along the cool, cracked surface. My hands halt at a slight depression in the wall, the faint outline of a door barely visible under the layers of dust and time. I press on it, and with a protesting creak, a hidden door swings open, revealing a dark passage leading to a refrigerated vault. A wave of cold air hits me, making me shiver. Cautiously, I step inside, my eyes taking a moment to adjust to the subdued light. The dim overhead lights cast an eerie glow, painting long shadows over rows of stainless steel shelving units. Each unit is loaded with vials, each filled with dark, congealed blood samples. The sight of them, perfectly aligned and stretching into the cold expanse of the room, sends an uncomfortable shiver racing down my spine. The silence is only broken by the soft hum of the cooling system. Slowly, I make my way down the first row. I pick up a vial, the glass is cold under my gloved fingers. The faded label reads a date from the early 1800s. The contents are shockingly well preserved. My scientific curiosity is piqued, and I begin a methodical examination of the samples. I pull out my tablet and start cataloging them, noting down the donor names and dates and any oddities I can discern with my eyes. I stumble upon a series of blood samples that are different from the rest. Their labels the names of donors I saw in previous samples, but as I cross-reference them with the old records I had discovered earlier, disturbing discrepancies emerge. The blood types specified in the records contradict the ones on the labels of the vials. O negative turns into B positive, and a positive morphs into AB negative. It's as though these vials contain not the blood of the donors listed, but that of entirely different individuals. I venture further into the collection. Here, the anomalies become even more peculiar. 
Some vials contain blood with cellular structures that are, for lack of a better word, bizarre. They're unlike anything I've ever seen, presenting strange growth patterns with even stranger biochemical reactions. It's as though they're not entirely human. My heart pounds heavier in my chest as I come across yet another deviation, samples that bear traces of a second, unidentified DNA strand. It's unheard of, unnatural even. The idea of two distinctly different DNA sequences coexisting in a single blood sample is the stuff of science fiction, yet the evidence lies right in front of me. After hours spent cataloging the blood samples, the chill of the refrigerated vault has seeped into my bones. The endless rows of vials begin to blur in front of my tired eyes. I decide to take a brief rest, leaning against the cold metallic wall for support. My fingers absent-mindedly trace over the cool, smooth surface of the wall, and to my surprise, I feel a subtle indent. Curious, I brush away the thin layer of frost to reveal an almost invisible seam. The realization strikes me with a rush. Another hidden door. My fatigue is momentarily forgotten. I press against the seam. There's a slight resistance before the door gives way, opening with a soft hiss. A new wave of cold air greets me, bringing with it a strange, sterile smell, different from the aged mustiness of the vault. The room beyond is dimly lit, filled with looming, hazy shapes. As I step inside, the shapes settle into rows of frost-covered glass containers. Human-sized containers. A chill runs through me, more potent than the freezing air. Walking up to one of them, I realize the containers hold bodies, perfectly preserved, their faces serene in their icy sleep. For a moment, I stand there, frozen in shock, as my gaze travels downwards and I see it. Just visible above the stiff collar of his shirt are two distinct puncture wounds. I pull my gaze away from the disturbing sight of the puncture wounds, my mind whirling. The rational part of me seeks an explanation, an animal bite, a medical procedure gone wrong, a cruel prank played by a lab assistant with a twisted sense of humor. The puncture marks are too precise and too clean to be an animal attack. As for a medical procedure, I rack my brain, but can't recall a single one that would leave such distinct marks. The idea of a prank seems equally unlikely. Who would, or even could, stage such a disturbing joke in this hidden room of preservation? As much as I want to dismiss it, the evidence is becoming increasingly difficult to ignore. The old photograph, the unexplained blood samples, the hidden bodies with their peculiar bites, it all points towards a terrifying, unthinkable conclusion. My eyes return to the face of the man frozen in time. A name echoes in my mind. Vampire. It's an absurd thought. A myth. A creature of horror novels and late-night movies. But then again, isn't this whole situation beyond the realm of the ordinary? A shudder runs down my spine as I contemplate the possibility. I've devoted my life to the pursuit of knowledge, but now I find myself on the brink of uncovering a truth that is more terrifying than anything I ever imagined. After leaving the refrigerated vault, I stand in the archive room. My mind is filled with questions, fears, and an unsettling sense of dread. But I push it all away, focusing instead on the task at hand. There's more to discover and more to understand. I make my way back to the archive shelves, my previous tiredness forgotten in the face of the disturbing discoveries. I found physical evidence, but now I need documentation, records, reports, anything that can shed light on the mysterious blood samples and the bodies in the vault. I sift through the mounds of paperwork and I come across old lab journals and personal diaries of scientists who worked on the project before me. The first journal I pick up is a dusty, leather-bound tome filled with neat, handwritten notes. I begin to read to myself. Entry dated April 10th, 1978. Dr. Vander seems to have an uncanny energy about him. I have yet to see him sleep or eat. He works through the night as if it were day. I flip through a few more entries. May 16th, 1978. I noted a strange occurrence today. 
while handling a blood sample, Dr. Vander seemed to recoil, almost as if he was in pain. He brushed it off as an allergic reaction, but it was unsettling. Another entry catches my eye. June 20th, 1978. We lost another subject today. Just like the last perfectly healthy one day and then... Nothing. They're gone. Dr. Vander has ordered the bodies to be cryopreserved. For further research, he says... The entries grow more erratic over time. July 3rd, 1978. I found a peculiar pattern of puncture wounds on one of the deceased. I pointed it out to Dr. Vander but he dismissed it as a trivial anomaly. But there was something in his eyes. The last entry in the journal sends a chill down my spine. July 12, 1978. I have been working too hard. The lab seems haunted at night. I keep seeing things in the shadows. Is it just fatigue? Or is it Dr. Vander? There's something wrong. I can't put my finger on it. I need to... No, this is ridiculous. Vampires do not exist. I flip the pages, but there are no more entries. It just ends. The silence in the room seems to grow heavier. As I read through more diaries, they all mirror the same observations, suspicions, and fears. Each scientist unknowingly inched closer to the truth, but could not bring themselves to believe it. The silence of the archive room is punctuated only by the sound of the final journal closing. I sit still for a moment the words of the past scientists resonating in my mind. My heart pounds in my chest, the echo of their fear now mine. My gaze drifts to the photograph of Professor Friedrich on my phone. I study the picture once again, taking in every detail. The same piercing blue eyes, identical sharp features, and distinguished silvering hair. The same face that has been haunting the pages of these journals for decades. The same face that I now suspect is not entirely human. For a moment, I contemplate sharing my findings with my colleagues, but I quickly discard the thought. They might dismiss my findings as a figment of an overworked mind or, worse, I could put them in danger. Instead, I meticulously gather all the evidence, the journals, a few blood samples with the unexplained cells, and pictures of the cryo-preserved bodies with the peculiar bite marks. Every piece of this terrifying puzzle that I can safely remove from this place. As I exit the archive room, I glance back one last time, the chilling secrets it held now in my possession. The weight of my discoveries, both physical and mental, seems heavier than ever. The longevity project isn't what I thought it was, and neither is Dr. Vander. With the evidence in my hands, I decide on my next course of action. I need to confront Dr. Vander. Whether it's tomorrow or the day after, I know I can't wait long. I have to tread carefully, but I can't let this continue. I must get answers, and if my worst fears are confirmed, I must find a way to stop him. As I walk out into the quiet night, the dimly lit lab behind me, I can't help but feel a sense of fear. The days following my horrifying discovery are a blur. The lab feels different now, tainted by the truth that lurks beneath its facade of scientific pursuit. I find myself constantly on edge, hyper-aware of every word spoken, every glance thrown my way. I can't help but look at Dr. Vander differently, each interaction laced with a sinister undertone. Yet, I must play my part, the unsuspecting scientist, while I harbor a secret that feels heavier with each passing day. As I continue my work, the weight of the secret I carry begins to feel unbearable. I realize I can't do this alone. I need an ally, and I know just the person. Lana. She's not just a colleague, but a close friend. She's always had an open mind, a curiosity that mirrors my own. It's a risk involving her, but it's one I have to take. I trust her. After work, we meet at a quiet cafe like we usually do. Sitting across from Lana, I take a deep breath and my heart pounds in my chest. The cafe's ambient noise hums in the background as I muster the courage to share my findings. Lana, I begin, my voice almost a whisper. There's something I need to show you. She looks up from her coffee, her warm brown eyes full of curiosity. Sure, Alex, what's up? 
I want you to promise me you'll keep an open mind, I say, my hand clutching the small stack of photographs and the transcriptions from the journals. It's... it's going to sound crazy. Her eyebrows furrow in concern. You're worrying me, Alex. Just spit it out. I lay out the photograph of Professor Friedrich and the transcriptions of the journal entries on the table between us. I found these in the archives, I explain, pointing to the old photograph. This man looks exactly like Dr. Vander, but the photo was taken 143 years ago. She picks up the photograph, studying it, a soft chuckle escaping her. Wow, it's uncanny, she admits, but it's probably just a look-alike. You know, like how they say everyone has a doppelganger somewhere in the world? But I shake my head, my heart pounding harder. There's more, I say, pushing the journal entries toward her. I found these entries from past scientists who worked with Dr. Vander. They all noticed his strange habits, his nocturnal tendencies. They suspected, they suspected he might not be human. Lana looks at me then, her expression filled with confusion and disbelief. Wait, are you saying that Dr. Vander is a... I complete her sentence. A vampire, Lana. I think Dr. Vander is a vampire. A silence envelops us as she processes my words, her eyes widening in disbelief before laughter spills from her lips. A vampire, Alex? She exclaims, trying to suppress her giggles. You can't be serious. But as my face remains grave, her laughter slowly subsides, her gaze flickering between me and the evidence laid out on the table. You're serious, she whispers, her voice filled with a mix of incredulity and concern. Yes, I confirm, nodding. I am, Lana. Deadly serious. I can see the gears turning in Lana's mind, skepticism battling with the evidence before her. As the weight of my revelations settle over us, Lana is silent, her gaze fixated on the evidence spread out on the table before her. I let her absorb it all, knowing she needs the space to wrestle with the outrageous theory I've just proposed. Finally, she breaks the silence. Okay, let's say for argument's sake, you're on to something, she starts, her voice hesitant. What are we supposed to do with this information? I've been asking myself the same question, I admit. But I think our first move is to find more evidence. Solid, irrefutable evidence. Like breaking into Dr. Vander's office? She asks, a sarcastic edge to her voice. I know she's testing me, trying to gauge how far I'm willing to take this. Exactly like that, I confirm, meeting her gaze. I can see her surprise at my response, her brows furrowing as she considers the implications. Alex, that's illegal. We could lose our jobs. Or worse, she warns, her expression grave. I know, Lana. I know the risks, I say earnestly. But if we're right, if Vander really is what we think he is, then we have a responsibility to uncover the truth. And I need you with me on this. She stares at me for a long moment, her brown eyes searching mine. I can see her weighing the risks, her intellect wrestling with the fear. And then, with a deep, resigned sigh, she gives a slow, cautious nod. Okay, Alex, she says. We'll do it. We'll find your evidence. With Lana on board, a wave of relief washes over me. As we leave the cafe, Lana and I head to my apartment. It's a safer place to discuss our plans, away from potential eavesdroppers. We sit at my small kitchen table, and we start to strategize. Dr. Vander usually leaves the lab by 7 p.m., I begin, thinking about his usual routine. We should wait until at least 9 to ensure he's gone home. Lana nods, writing down the details in a small notepad. Do you know the layout of his office? I've been in a few times, I say, trying to recall the details. He has a large wooden desk, bookshelves lining one wall, a seating area near the windows, and a locked cabinet where he keeps sensitive documents. Lana's eyes flicker at the mention of the locked cabinet. Any idea how we can get it open? I shake my head. No, but I think I might know someone who can help us. Over the next few days, we prepare for our covert operation. 
I managed to borrow a lockpick set from an old college friend who has a fascination with locksmithing. Lana studies blueprints of the lab that she managed to find online, memorizing potential exit routes and hiding spots. In the evenings, we meet at my apartment to go over the details again and again. Lana suggests we should have a cover story in case we're caught. We decide to say we were working late and noticed a light in Dr. Vander's office and worried about a potential security breach, we decided to check it out. The day before our planned break-in, Lana and I meet for a final time to finalize our plan. We go through each step, visualizing our movements and reminding ourselves of the cover story. As we part ways that night, there's a shared sense of anticipation between us. We know that tomorrow could change everything. The following evening, the lab is eerily quiet. Most of the lights are off, with only a few illuminating the long hallways. We wait in my office until the clock strikes nine. Then, we start our journey to Dr. Vander's office. Our footsteps echo in the empty corridors as we creep toward Dr. Vander's office. We're lucky, no one else is working late. When we arrive at the office, I pull out the lockpick set. After a few tense moments, there's a soft click, and the door creaks open. We slip inside, closing the door quietly behind us. His office is larger than I remember. The moonlight shining through the window behind the desk casts an eerie glow across the room, catching on the metallic surfaces and glinting off the glass of framed accolades on the wall. We waste no time, moving quickly to the locked cabinet. It takes a bit longer to unlock, but eventually, it gives way. Inside, we find a trove of documents, project plans, research notes, correspondence, and more. I start flipping through them, looking for anything related to the longevity project or anything unusual. After a few minutes, Lana finds a hidden drawer in the cabinet filled with older documents. Lana pulls out a stack of documents, her eyes wide as she scans the pages. Alex, you have to see this, she whispers, her voice hoarse with disbelief. Taking the stack of papers from Lana, I begin to read aloud. Experiment Log, September 17, 1891. Subject 43. Blood samples have been successfully merged, displaying a remarkable resilience under microscopic examination. The subject has exhibited improved night vision, enhanced speed and reflexes, but displays increased aggression. Cravings for blood observed. My voice shakes slightly as I continue. Subject's mental state deteriorating rapidly. Aggressive tendencies are becoming harder to control, endangering lab personnel. The decision has been made to terminate the experiment. I pause, taking a deep breath before I move on to the next document. Conversion Plan, Phase 1, Gradual Introduction of Vampire Blood into the Human Subject's System. Dosages are to be increased incrementally, monitoring mental state closely. Phase 2, Alteration of the Subject's Circadian Rhythm to Match a Nocturnal Lifestyle. Phase 3, Further Increments of Vampire Blood Introduction and Adaptation to a Blood Diet. I read the chilling conclusion. Goal. Successful conversion of a human into a vampire while maintaining mental stability, thereby creating a new breed of beings capable of integrating into human society. My hand trembles as I pick up the final document. It's a letter. Dr. Vander, your contributions to our cause are invaluable. The successful conversion of a human is the key to our ascendance. With the power to blend in with our food source, we will be unstoppable. Keep up the good work, your eternal friend, E. I swallow hard. The weight of what I've just read settles heavily on us. There's no longer any room for doubt. Dr. Vander is not just a vampire, he's part of something bigger. We need to copy these, Lana says, breaking the silence. Her voice is quiet but steady. I nod, pull out my phone and start taking pictures of the documents. Once we've taken pictures of all the documents, we carefully return everything to where we found it. We can't afford to rouse any suspicion, not when we're dealing with a creature as dangerous as Dr. Vander. As we're getting out of his office, Lana's foot catches on something, causing her to stumble. 
When we look down, we see that she's tripped over a trap door hidden under an ornate rug. The trap door leads to a basement, a crypt filled with ancient coffins and artifacts, the definitive proof of Dr. Vander's age and true nature. Taking a deep breath, Lana and I crouch down to inspect the trap door. It's heavy, made of old weathered wood with an iron ring for a handle. With a shared nod, we lift it, revealing a narrow stairway that descends into the darkness below. The door swings open with an ominous creak, revealing a set of old stone stairs that disappear into the darkness below. The air that wafts up is musty and old, a faint echo of centuries long past. Stealing ourselves, we descend, our phone flashlights slicing through the darkness. The basement is more than just a basement. It's a crypt. The air down here is significantly colder, tinged with a metallic scent. The space is expansive, with high vaulted ceilings lost in shadow and stone walls lined with a collection of ancient coffins. Gothic chandeliers hang from the ceiling, their candles long extinguished. The coffins themselves are elaborate, some adorned with golden trimmings and inscriptions in languages I can't identify. They're disturbingly well-preserved, untouched by time. On a central podium, there's a coffin larger and more ornate than the rest, undoubtedly belonging to Dr. Vander. Around the room, there are countless artifacts, old books, maps, jewelry, and trinkets from all over the world, spanning centuries, it's a chilling testament to the age and travels of the creature we've been working for. As we walk through the crypt, our footsteps echo off the cold stone. This is the heart of the vampire's lair, the evidence of his dark immortality. With one last glance around the room, Lana and I wordlessly agree that it's time to leave. We've seen enough. We quickly ascend the stairs, closing the trap door behind us and restoring the rug to its original position. We exit the office, our minds reeling from the truth we've uncovered. The longevity project is so much more than it seems. The days following our discovery in Dr. Vander's office are a whirlwind of fear and determination. Lana and I gather all the evidence we've found. The pictures, the blood samples, the archived bodies, the journal entries, and the copies of the documents from Vander's office. One evening... After another round of evidence gathering, we're heading out of the lab when the lights in the corridor suddenly flicker and die. Then, a voice slices through the quiet. Alex. Lana. It's Dr. Vander. The lights flick back on, and there he is at the end of the corridor, his usually warm smile replaced with a cold, hard stare. He slowly approaches us, hands in his pockets. It seems you two have been quite busy these past nights. We exchange a glance before I muster the courage to speak. We know, Dr. Vander, I say, my voice shaking slightly. About you. About the longevity project. He pauses, then chuckles, but there's no warmth in the sound. I suppose it was a matter of time before someone found out, he admits, his piercing blue eyes unwavering. But did you consider the potential? The promise of endless life? His gaze shifts to Lana. Lana, wouldn't you want to see the future? Experience the evolution of mankind without the constraints of mortality? Lana hesitates, her eyes meeting mine. There's a glimmer of temptation in them, but it quickly fades. But at what cost, Dr. Vander? What gives you the right to play God? Vander shrugs his demeanor casual, as if we're discussing a trivial matter. It's not about playing God, Lana. It's about evolution, progress, and I am offering you a part in it. But not at the cost of our humanity, I retort, taking a step forward. We won't be a part of your monstrous experiments, Vander. The air around us feels heavy, charged with tension. Vander's smile fades, replaced by a hard, almost menacing expression. Well then, he says, taking a step back. That's quite unfortunate. You leave me no choice. In the deafening silence that follows Vander's exit, Lana and I exchange a wide-eyed look. The air feels colder somehow, stripped of Vander's chilling presence, but saturated with his ominous parting words. Alex, Lana murmurs. What did he mean by no choice? 
My mind races, piecing together Vander's threat. We've backed him into a corner, and a cornered creature is a dangerous one. I think he's going to escalate the project, I reply. He won't stop now, not when he's been exposed. Alex, we need a plan, Lana says, the usual spark in her eyes replaced with determination. She's right. We need to weaken him, I say, a spark of an idea forming. The documents mentioned an ancient vampiric weakness. If we can exploit it, Lana catches on instantly. We can neutralize Vander long enough to expose him and bring the whole project down. The world outside is dark and silent as we head toward my apartment. Inside, my apartment is quiet and warm, a contrast to the chill of fear that clings to us. We move to the living room, where a hastily assembled workstation is piled with evidence, documents, blood samples, photos, and the personal journals of past scientists. Lana plops down onto the couch, her eyes scanning the mountain of evidence we've gathered. All right, Alex, she begins, her voice echoing in the quiet room. Let's get to work. We spend the next several hours combing through the information, searching for any mention of the ancient vampiric weakness. The documents from Vander's hidden drawer prove to be the most informative, providing glimpses into centuries of vampiric study and experimentation. I think I found something, Lana murmurs, holding up a weathered document. It's written in an archaic script, but the drawings that accompany the text depict a figure writhing in apparent agony, surrounded by sunlight. I squint at the faded ink, my pulse quickening. Sunlight. It makes sense. Vampires are creatures of the night. But we need something more. Something that can incapacitate him, even in the absence of sunlight. Nestled among the numerous entries on vampiric attributes and immortality experiments, we find it. A specific compound is repeatedly referenced with a coded name. As scientists, Lana and I have been trained to solve complex problems, to decipher codes both in genes and in documents. This one is no different. We analyze the document, noting the use of ancient symbols and cryptic notations, a language of science wrapped in a layer of obfuscation that has probably protected its secrets for centuries. Each symbol, each notation, represents an element, a molecule. The text isn't just a name, it's a formula. The realization hits us simultaneously. Lana, who's more experienced in organic chemistry, takes the lead, sketching the symbols and linking them together. Hours pass as we work, drawing chemical structures and cross-referencing them with modern molecular databases. The patterns start to make sense. It's a peptide, a complex one with an unusual chain of amino acids. As I study the final structure, I realize what we have. It's a protein disruptor, I explain, my voice filled with awe and a chilling sense of realization. If we're correct, this compound should interfere with the vampire's heightened regenerative abilities. Lana looks at me, her eyes wide. You mean it could make him vulnerable? I nod. Exactly. If we can synthesize this compound, we could effectively nullify Dr. Vander's strength and rapid healing. The days following our revelation are a whirlwind of activity. We spend hours on end in Lana's makeshift home lab, synthesizing the complex compound we'd uncovered in Vander's hidden documents. The task is daunting, but we are both spurred on by the urgency of our situation. Armed with the decoded formula and a deep understanding of biochemistry, we set to work. The compound involves a series of chemical reactions that we meticulously plan out. Precision is key, and we carefully measure out each ingredient, knowing that even the smallest error could render our efforts useless. One by one, we execute the reactions. Some are straightforward, like simple dehydration synthesis, but others involve more intricate processes, requiring careful temperature control and meticulous timing. Finally, after several long nights, we have it. A small vial of clear liquid, the compound that could potentially level the playing field against Vander. To ensure the compound works as intended, we test it on the preserved vampire blood we'd found in the archives. As we introduce the compound, the vibrant, 
almost ethereal glow of the vampire blood dulls significantly, its once vibrant red color paling to a darker hue. It's working. The compound is disrupting the vampire blood's regenerative properties. It's a success, a triumph over the fear that had taken hold of us. But as we stare at the vial of the compound, we realize that this is just the beginning. With the compound successfully synthesized, it's time for us to face him. Lana and I prepare ourselves, running through the plan one last time before we set off for the lab. Our return to the lab feels surreal. It's eerily quiet. We tread quietly, our hearts pounding in unison as we navigate the darkened hallways. Reaching Dr. Vander's office, we find him exactly where we expected, hunched over his desk, engrossed in his work. Our entrance startles him, his eyes widening in surprise, but then he smiles, a cold, predatory grin. I've been expecting you, he says. Before he can react, Lana hurls herself at him, going for the element of surprise. They grapple. For a moment, it seems she has the upper hand, but then Vander, with a growl, flings her aside. I lunge at Vander, my hands clutching the vial of the compound tightly. He evades me with a swift, fluid movement that showcases his unnatural agility. I roll and recover, barely missing a beat, but Vander is on me again. His fist connects with my face, and I stagger back, pain flashing across my vision. But there's no time to recover. I see Vander moving towards Lana, who is still on the floor. Ignoring the throbbing pain in my face, I charge at him again. This time, I manage to get a grip on his arm. With all my strength, I jab the makeshift injector into his flesh and press the plunger. A roar of pain echoes through the room. Vander spins around, his face contorted in agony. For a moment, the office is a whirl of chaos as Vander fights against the sudden onset of weakness. His usually precise movements become clumsy, and his features pale. Lana, regaining her composure, quickly helps me up, and we both dart towards Vander. He attempts to fight back, but his movements are sluggish, and we manage to secure his hands and feet with the cuffs we brought along. He pushes against the restraints, but the compound and his weakening state work against him. We leave him writhing on the office floor, his strength depleted, and his plans of immortality thwarted. As we make our exit, dawn begins to break, the first rays of sunlight filtering in through the office windows. As they touch Vander's skin, he lets out an inhuman scream, the sun's rays intensifying his pain and ensuring his incapacitation. We quickly gather the rest of the evidence strewn across the office. The adrenaline still coursing through our veins helps us move with a sense of urgency. As we rush through the hallways, the lab feels like a ghost of its former self, shrouded in shadows and heavy with the reality of its dark secret. Emerging from the lab into the early morning light, I can't help but feel a sense of profound relief washing over me. For the moment, the threat is neutralized. We've managed to stop Vander's monstrous plans, but there's a lot left to be done. Lana and I part ways, agreeing to meet up later in the day. We need rest, but we also need to discuss our next steps. The longevity project needs to be exposed. The public needs to know the truth. We have the evidence. It's just a matter of how we release it. As I make my way home, the streets seem unusually serene. Maybe it's the lingering effect of the night's events, but the world looks a little different to me. The fight isn't over, not by a long shot. But today, we won a significant battle. We stopped a vampire's plan to manipulate humanity. And somehow, in that victory, I find a renewed sense of purpose.